Anyway, it's a totally different game, and, and, and it's more complex in many ways. It's also much more boring than a normal billiard game, but, uh, and also I didn't put any rules except the basic rules of hitting two balls with your own ball, and people play it, I play it sometimes, and the rules, they have to be invented. I try to use the tools that everyone can use. I don't want to be a specialist in a technique that is very difficult. I prefer to be a beginner. Oh, no, I like to learn how to fix cars, and then I did the Citroën. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in cars. Even I think sometimes when I do like a ceramic, I, it's like a hobby for me, I think. It's more like, well, yeah, I, I like ceramics. It's nice. I want to learn a little bit. It's exactly what you define a hobby. Normally when you do pottery, you are very much aware of this empty center space. In this case, I was not so interested in the center, but as a mass. For that reason, I needed a clay that was special. And this workshop used to be a brick factory before but they have this machine to produce clay that I need very fast. Uh, so in one day you can do a whole amount of hours, almost like a worker doing a mechanical thing. And for me that was important. The thinking process is related with the body in many ways. To be moving in a train or to be looking at the ocean, to be working with my hands with the clay and very physical, all generates a stimulus in the brain and you are thinking. The connection between the brain and the breathing and the sweating and the time that you spend and how you slow down thinking or you accelerate thinking, you just generate a different aspects of thinking. So when I feel that it should be ready, it's a quite subjective thing, but it's just that the shape should represent what just happened before. Now, pot is a very complex instrument in human history. Can be related with Mexico if you want, but I think it can be related with Greece, it can be related with everybody in the world. Because pottery is just part of our history. The division between work and everyday life is very strong. In Mexico, it's the same. And that space in between work and life is the space that is very hard to negotiate for everybody. Leisure time, or pleasure time, or knowledge time, or research time. Or, or that space that is a leftover because the important thing is to work and then to sustain your life or something. But then all the spaces in between are a bit lost. So every citizen has to fight for those spaces.
when you live and you work in the same place. So everything is part of the work. Every furniture is important, every little thing. Even the trash. The contradiction that I have is that when I say I don't want to produce things, but at the same time, there is this necessity of producing signs of communication, a, a kind of mirror of what I'm doing. And um, maybe it's an obsession of building bridges of communication with other people. A rope is an umbilical cord, you know, it's something that connects two things. Which sort of is what more is about. It's about all these people being, you know, my life sort of connecting all these people. The idea was to take all these very different materials, but also lives, and sort of bring them together through the rope making process. My mother's fall I put in there. And then um, my friend Pat uh, made this piece with hammocks. So this is, that's what this is. Um, another friend's piece, Doug, um, this is his high eight tape that we took apart. And uh, this is sort of my favorite section. This is the section of the grandmothers. This red dress is my father's mother's Christmas dress. I wonder whether the viewer can in some way uncover these stories through their experience of the object, whether these stories are somehow held in the material. With a lot of the materials, what was done is they were cut up into strips. Or um, say if it was an electrical cord, it was taken apart and all the wires inside were taken apart and then um, twisted together with other materials uh, to create a rope. Since I was a little girl, my mother and I would make things together. Actually, the whole family would make things together. And uh, I love the handmade in any form it takes. There's so many objects that we come in contact with that we've lost a connection to what they're made of, who made them. So 
that's really important for me to sort of, in the object, on the surface of the object, somehow give you a history of how that object's made its way into the world. To make this piece, what I did is I dipped myself in a tub of lard. The piece is called Eureka, and it was inspired by the story of Archimedes. And Archimedes was asked by the king how much gold was in his crown, and he was killing himself. How can he measure capacity? Well, he's in the bathtub one night, and he realizes that his body is displacing the water in the tub. Um, he gets very excited, jumps out, and screams, Eureka. It seems to me that Archimedes' body was the tool for the experiment, just as my body is the tool for making. But most importantly is this idea that he came to this knowledge through the experience of his body. And that's why I do these kind of extreme acts with my body. I feel that the viewer has a body too and can empathize with what I put myself through to make the artwork. To me, so much meaning is in how we choose to make something, both in art but in all objects that we deal with in our lives. I kind of think of the work as like the viewers coming in on the scene of a crime, and I've left all these clues for them to uncover. I did this show, and the exhibition space was connected to a dairy farm. Right away, I said, can you give me a tour of the barn? And I noticed that troughs are made out of tubs. I thought, what if I take a bath? Will the cow continue to drink? Thinking that, you know, I've drunk from the cow my whole life, and I could sort of create this relationship. Well, cows are very curious. They all came, started drinking, and it almost reversed the whole relationship. She looks like she's nursing from me. And the title of the piece is 2038, which is the, the tag in the ear. And the reason I chose that is I felt that that epitomized our relationship to the cow, that it was almost like a, hardly an animal anymore, but a biological machine. And I wanted that to contrast the kind of tenderness of the image. I was really thinking about the Virgin Mary and these images we know of her. Like, the Virgin Mary's not allowed to do anything physical, no sex, she doesn't get to die. The only thing she's allowed to do is nurse. And um, I was thinking about how does that image affect my, um, my ideas of motherhood and that sort of idyllic moment that we know from those paintings but also from Pampers' ads of mother and child. looking at is a bucket from a construction tractor. It was twice the size, and I got the bucket cut in half, and I melted it down, and I created all these forms inside. Cradle is a piece which is really about these things cradling each other. You know, it ends with the loop spoon, which is like when the child is be first becoming independent, can first feed itself. And then it's, it's about that need that we never lose to be held. All the cow pieces were an effort to relate to the cow, to understand it and to understand my relationship to it. And so for me to get on my hands and knees is really to imitate the animal in some way. But also 
It's clearly a submissive pose. This work is made out of raw hide. I made a mold of myself on my hands and knees. And then I took the raw hide when it was very malleable and I draped it over the mold. I worked with all the folds, sculpting them to depict the body underneath the veil. Then, when the hide was completely hard, I removed the mold from the inside. So actually, she's totally hollow inside. And that's really important because um, I really want the viewer to feel both the absence of me and the absence of the cow. I thought it was really interesting that soap was made out of lard, that we're cleaning the body with the body. It seemed quite curious to me. So I had this idea that I would make a replica of myself in chocolate and in soap, and I would feed myself with myself by licking the chocolate and wash myself with myself. Both the licking and the bathing are quite gentle and loving acts, but I'm slowly erasing myself. For me, it's about that conflict, that kind of love-hate relationship we have with our physical appearance. And really, like, the problem I have of looking in the mirror and thinking, is that who I am? As I was making the rope, I thought it would be really nice to walk on this rope. <laughs> so I was thinking of the rope as a kind of lifeline, you know, the story of my life. So I thought, wow, if I could walk on it, that would really be beautiful. So it was sort of making the rope that made me come to the idea to learn to tightrope. I practice tightroping for about an hour a day. And after about a week, I started to feel like I'm now getting my balance. I started to notice that it wasn't that I was getting more balanced, but that I was getting more comfortable with being out of balance. Rather than getting nervous and overcompensating, I could just compensate enough, and I thought, I wish I could do that in my life. After going down many different avenues, I decided to make this work touch. And what I did is I went home to the Bahamas, to the beach that was directly in front of the house that I grew up in. It made sense for me to go back to this horizon I had looked at my whole life. I thought it would have much more tension if I could walk along the rope and as it dipped, that just for a moment, I would touch the horizon.
And so at a certain point, after making the video touch and sort of living my fantasy of walking on the air, walking on the horizon, I thought, I really need to do a piece about falling. And I went back to this idea that I wanted to make the rope to walk on. We found a guy at Mystic Seaport, and he gave us a personal tour and showed us this quite beautiful rope-making machine. And when we saw that machine, then we got the idea, you know, to make our own mini version of it. Making the rope brought me to, to learning how to spin. Where with more, we're using everyday materials. Now we're using the most traditional material, which is hemp. On a material level, and I'm going back to the source, but also those crafts are sort of the beginning. And I think that this taking on this woman's tradition is, an, is also not a small thing. You have to put the right amount of energy into the twist. Too much energy makes the rope weak, and too little energy makes the rope weak. So the correlation that I see with learning to walk on the tight wire, the looser I was, the easier it was to balance. I'm not sure what this sculpture I'm making with the hemp and and the tightrope will be exactly, but it will be about the fall. It will, it will be about the impossibility of that illusion. Next time on Art 21, art in the 21st century. There's a certain freshness where you're seeing something for the first time. There's something inherently compelling about repetition. I always tend to see the funny sides of things. It's a dark humor, but it makes me chuckle when I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs>